Okay, welcome, welcome everyone. We got uh, well, close to 20 now. I'm sure there'll be a few people uh, filtering in as we go. I uh, just wanted to remind everybody we are recording today. Uh, you will be on mute uh, to avoid any background noise and such. Uh, you can put your questions into the chat and we will answer them when we're uh, finished off. Felicia will take care of that. And all of the resources, the recordings, PowerPoints, the handouts, this is stuff that's going to be available on the Parents as Partners TDSB uh, website. So don't worry about screenshots or any of that stuff. You're going to have full access to all this stuff. So let's just give it another minute and see if anyone else is coming in, and then we'll get started. Oh, I see a few familiar names in the in the group. Uh, hi, my name is Nicole Herbert. Uh, I come along here with 15 years of experience as a school council chair. I've been an active member of my ward council. I've represented my ward on PIAC, the Parent Involvement Advisory Committee, where I currently am a member of the Communications and Outreach Working Group. Uh, Joining us today is our lovely assistant, Felicia Lau, who is the PIAC rep for Ward 3. And she's going to be managing the uh, technical piece, the, the questions in the chat box, and the microphones. Thank you, Felicia. You're welcome. Thank you, Nicole. I'm thrilled to be a part of this uh, workshop and supporting you as you share your uh, tidbits of uh, nuggets of making school councils more meaningful. Thank you. So one of the reasons that we started this topic is that we hear a lot this same question. How do I get more parents to come out to my school council? So we're going to have a look at that uh, topic today uh, from a slightly different standpoint. Uh, we want to attract people to our council by being meaningful to them. And that's a slightly different approach than you may be used to. So let's start at the beginning. Um, the purpose and mandate of school councils is laid out in the Education Act, Ontario Regulation 612. This is law that governs school councils among other things. And it defines school councils as an advisory body to improve student achievement and enhance the accountability of the education system to parents. So that's two arms, the student improvement piece and the accountability piece. School council actions should be revolving around this mandate. That's why you're here. So looking at engagement a little more, um, true engagement is more than just how many people come out to your events. It's what happens at home. And this is based in solid research that proves over and over again that it's what parents are doing at home that really impacts that student achievement piece. So to be a more uh, valuable counsel to our community, we under need to understand what parents want and what parents want us for their kids to do well. And isn't that handy that that's one of the pieces of our purpose. So engagement for, and involvement are mostly used interchangeably, and I'd like to suggest that we think about them differently. Involvement tends to be what we see the most. It's um, the pieces where the parents are in the school helping and fundraising, and typical involvement activities are very helpful to the school, but they serve their agenda, and they don't impact student learning. They're also reliant on the comfort level of parents with the school culture and being there and their capacity and ability to be there in that time slot. So it is somewhat restrictive as a model. Whereas engagement, this is what happens at home. Engagement, everyone can do this, there's no limit. And engagement is bringing that knowledge base of parents to the table. 
And by the way, today I'm going to be saying the word parent over and over again, but parent includes caregivers, guardians, and basically anybody who's doing the work of parenting. So what does engagement look like at home? This conversation was inspired by Dr. Debbie Pusher, who uh, is an engagement specialist out of Saskatchewan. You can look her up. She's very interesting. And uh, engagement is, is quite simple. You're already doing it at home by just asking your child, how was your day? Showing your interest in their school life uh, builds that value and that buy-in. And it's those simple things that are really parent engagement, the reading, the baking, the doing activities together. What then does it look like with engagement at the school council level? Well, this is the part where it becomes a, a relationship, a partnership, and uh, what we want to do for engagement at school council is bringing that parent knowledge piece to the school. You're gonna work with your principal on involving parents in some of the mandated committees. We're gonna talk about those. You're going to um, tell parents about what's happening at school. That's building parent capacity and that assists them with their engagement at home. And it also draws them into your school council because you're giving them what they wanna know. I also wanna make sure that we're addressing parents who are not meeting goers because really that group of parents represents a much larger portion of your school population than the parents who are interested in meetings because not everyone's going to want to come to a meeting doesn't mean that those parents are not engaged they're engaged at home and no don't mistake their presence or lack thereof at your school for a lack of engagement we all want our kids to do well that's engaging so we want to be valuable to our school community to draw more parents uh, to our school council activities and efforts. We wanna plan for engagement with those two arms of the mandate. Remember the two pieces, improving student achievement and enhancing the accountability of the system. What does that look like? Student achievement looks, uh, supporting looks like supporting the families and building that parent capacity by workshops perhaps, uh, discussing the classroom initiatives and uh, building community with community events. The accountability piece uh, is, is the partnership relationship. It's participating on those school committees that parents are mandated to be a part of. It's participating in board and or ministry consultations. There are always uh, something going on. The regular schedule of policy reviews at the TDSB, for example, you can access that on the TDSB site and on the PIAC website. Um, the policy consultations right now are a little challenged because there's no public meetings, but there still are public consultations. So if you go to um, the PX October newsletter, you can access that from our website. Uh, you can click on uh, the sections where there are consultation opportunities for parents. Another awesome thing that parents get to do, thanks to PIAC, is participate on the interview committees. When a teacher is applying to become a vice principal, parents get to sit on that interview team and impact directly who goes through, who gets promoted to become a vice principal. So parents have an impactful voice in who will become administrators in our schools. I strongly encourage you to take part in these opportunities. They're once or twice a year and you can keep an eye on uh, the PIAC broadcasts in the social media and uh, hopefully through your uh, council email uh, that will notify you when these things are coming up. So using the tools we already have in place, the committees I was talking about, the areas that are mandated either by the ministry or the TDSB for parent involvement on the school committees. Number one, the school improvement plan. Every school has to have one of these. It's exactly like what it sounds. It is the plan the schools use to address student improvement. So there's three arms of that, equity, well-being and achievement, and the school will have goals in these three areas. 
and parents are to be involved in the development of this plan. The principal is to prepare, is to prepare it in consultation with the school community. Uh, other mandated committees the school is required to have, uh, Caring and Safe Schools, Staffing Committee, SIP, and Budget Consultation. So different schools handle these a little bit differently. The Caring and Safe Schools Committee uh, is a place where some schools do their mental health work. Uh, and obviously right now it's going to be a place though it's a pretty hot ticket because of COVID. The staffing committee uh, is the committee that um, creates the staffing models in the spring going towards the next year. Most of the time, if a school council is involved in this at all, it's a presentation of the finished model and I that's not the intention. The intention is that parents are to be involved in the development of that plan too. So ask to be involved in that earlier in the spring and rather than just get to rubber stamp the finished plan, ask to be a part of the process. Now that's an elementary uh, description. At secondary, there are um, obstacles for that exact uh, participation because of the complexity of uh, scheduling secondary and because of the collective agreement in secondary. So at secondary level, the staffing looks more like an information sharing piece. Uh, in the budget, uh, you're required to uh, know about the budget. It should be transparent. The budget's something you can pull up for every school on the website, on the TDSB website. Some schools have a separate budget committee that meets to discuss the budget and some share that at the school council level. Once had a principal that did a full line by line rundown at school council meeting in the fall to talk about the budget. Uh, not everyone's going to have that picture, but I encourage you to look for participating in these committees. And I would like to say a piece about uh, funding for school councils, because that is also something that school councils will be deciding on. The uh, ministry provides via the TDSB two pockets of funding and these have recently been confirmed. Every school gets a flat $500 to be dedicated to parent engagement activities. How great is that? We're trying to engage parents, here's money to do it. The other pocket is a, a enrollment based. It's $1.25 per student in your school. That is school council administration funds basically for childcare, uh, pizza, translations, that kind of thing. These two pockets of money are found on GL41500. GL41500 is the general ledger number in the school's budget. If you're talking to your administration, they're not quite sure which money you're talking about. It's the money on that general ledger line. The spending of this money, both of these pockets, are a school council decision. You discuss it, you decide together. The principal doesn't choose how this money gets spent. It's a consultation with council. You decide together. So for your plan, you're going to gather information from a variety of areas within your community. So you can use the school improvement plan. This is the number one place. What the school wants to do is probably what the school council wants to do to support that student learning piece. Uh, the participants from the school committees will have input to your plan. You may have subcommittees for your school council and you can do broad surveys of staff and parents because they both have a lot to offer uh, as far as school planning goes. And remember to uh, choose the items that are pertinent to your mandate, the two arms of your mandate, and look at what your school community really needs what kind of, of, of things are showing up on the plan and the survey results that are common? What can we support as a school council? Fundraising. Everybody who knows me knows that I am not a fan of fundraising for a variety of reasons I won't go into completely, but definitely there's an equity issue with fundraising. And what I find especially at the elementary level, is that fundraising becomes parent busy work. That is taking you away from doing the work that you are there to do. It's not part of your mandate. You remember me saying the two arms of your mandate? Did I say fundraising? 
No, fundraising is not what you're there to do. You are permitted to fundraise within Regulation 612, but you don't have to. You don't. So if you are going to fundraise, I want you to really think hard about what you're doing, what it's for, and how much time you're spending doing it. If it's taking away from you doing your mandated tasks, then maybe you want to rethink how much fundraising you're doing. If you're paying for things that aren't improving student achievement, what are you doing? Are you funding a ski trip? Is that going to improve student achievement? Or maybe having a mental health uh, speaker for youth mental well-being is going to improve that. So stay on target. Identify your goals the same way your rest of your school council goals are using that school improvement plan and all that other information, and then really evaluate the wish list. And if things have to change, things have to change. This is a plan that actually has to be written down. There is a template for it. So if you're fundraising, you prepare this plan and submit to your principal. And that's a living plan. It can be changed throughout the year. Uh, and publish it. Let people know. If you're asking them for their hard-earned money, then they should know what you're going to do with it. Uh, within this current environment, there are a few added pieces to the fundraising pie. Uh, the regular restrictions are always there, and there are a, a series of rules about fundraising and a lot of paperwork that goes along with it. Uh, you can find these easily in the School Council's uh, toolkit that is on the PIAC site. There are links to all of that stuff. And the regular restrictions involved, basically, the School Council cannot pay for things that the government covers. So nothing that is required to deliver the curriculum, nothing connected to the facility, you cannot pay for staff positions. Current restrictions that the board has in place right now uh, means that fundraising activities are on hold until November 1st. So we should be seeing some new information soon about that. You can still use school cash online for direct donations and you are not allowed to pay for safety equipment right now. And there's a tough conversation about that, but let's just say no safety gear. I also think that the equity piece is quite pertinent right now regarding fundraising not all of your families are going to be in a position to contribute right now. Let's be sensitive about that. That said, if you're hell-bent on fundraising, there are some other options that I could suggest that might be um, pertinent at this time. Your student nutrition programs, your snack, your breakfast, your lunch, whatever you have at your school, these are programs that are going to be really starving for money right now, to use the appropriate analogy. Um, they have to serve prepackaged uh, items right now, which are very much more expensive than the kinds of foods that they have been serving. Guarantee you, your school nutrition program will be needing money this year. You can donate directly from your school council to the school nutrition program. You can also go through TFSS, which is the Toronto Foundation for Student Success. That is the uh, body that mm, manages student nutrition programs at the board. Uh, you could also consider dis your school's discretionary fund. Many schools have a fund that is in place that the principal administers that helps families that need it for a variety of things. Um, a uniform for the kid, sports team, uh, prom tickets, transit, a variety of things. This is a great place to be able to support the parents who really need it right now. Uh, you can also donate centrally through School Cash Online uh, to the t through the TDSB, and you can select different uh, destinations for your money directly to your school. You can go directly to technology support and a variety of other things. And you might want to consider the food bank right now for if your community is one that's uh, struggling with food insecurity right now, that might be a place you can talk about. So another thing that we do as a school council is that we consult parents on basically any matter that's under consideration by the council. Uh, this is not a task. This is a great opportunity to connect with families and build relationships and really, you know, find out what they are about, and what they want. There are certain areas that we must consult our community with on the dress code, school code of conduct changes, uh, and then those school committees, the school improvement plan, carrying and safe budget. The school statement of needs, we haven't talked about that. That is a document that parents prepare 
and submit directly to your superintendent in uh, November. Um, this document outlines what is special and unique about your school community and the superintendent uses that document when they're placing a new administrator in your school. There's a template for this and a guide on the PIAC website, so you can click in that. Right now it's due, I believe, November 13th. I know that some councils haven't even formed yet, so I don't think we're going to be too worried about our hard deadlines this year, but do keep in mind that you, this is something that we'll need to get done. So how do we consult our families about these things? Well, surveys is gonna be your number one go-to right now, especially because we're doing pretty much everything online right now. But you could also consider hosting a dedicated meeting, uh, you know, or your November meeting is going to be about the school statement of needs, or maybe your December meeting is going to be about the school improvement plan conversation. You can also host um, specific discussion groups for those within your meeting or separate from the meeting. Um, remember to make sure you're transparent and you're being as inclusive as you can of your school community, which may mean you're having um, um, culturally sensitive uh, meetings. And my, well, I had a principal who used to do the coffee mornings with uh, our dominant uh, cultural community. Uh, we'll have to do that virtually now. Uh, when you're consulting your families also though, I want you to remember you gotta listen, listen and respond. If you're gonna ask your parents for their opinion and they put it in there and then they never hear again about what happened with that, they're not going to feel like you're a very responsible, respectful group. You wanna provide the feedback from your consultations. You ask them for their opinion, Tell them what you did with that. What was the result of that feedback? How did that impact uh, your plan? If it was for a specific document, make sure you share that document so they know that their feedback was represented. So the uh, pandemic has provided some kind of interesting opportunities for engagement. Uh, virtual world has attracted what we're finding is more parents to school council meetings. And I'm thinking this is partly because it's removing some of the barriers to participating, uh, the barriers for, around time, managing childcare, and how comfortable parents are coming to the school and being part of this weird thing that is the school council meeting. Uh, so their comfort level is it, better when they can be here in the list without their face being shown, they can still participate. And that um, opens great doors for other ways of engaging parents. I'm strongly going to encourage you to take your fabulous free Zoom account and host virtual get togethers. This is an awesome opportunity to learn from your community and diversify and create that cross-cultural piece. You can build connection by just having conversations with your communities. And when they see that you as the school council are interested and value what they have to say, then that's gonna also create buy-in for your school council. You're gonna create two-way respect. And isn't that great? So to recap the whole planning piece, set your goals based on the information that you've gathered, make sure that these goals are matching your mandate and make sure that they also uh, address your school's needs. Include all of the groups uh, for feedback. If you wanna form subcommittees, this is a great way to change the way you may be doing work right now. If you divide and conquer by setting up subcommittees to do some of this tasking, then your general meetings are open for more conversation about mandated topics. A note about subcommittees. Subcommittees are accountable to the same rules that a general meeting is. They must be open meetings, they must take their minutes, and they must include one elected representative of your school council, otherwise you've got some rogue group going on. And that elected member is there to make sure that we're all 
keeping track of our mandates. And this plan should be written down. It's an excellent reference point. It doesn't have to be a glamorous, fancy document, but writing your, idea, your goals down, perhaps prioritizing, is going to help you um, be more productive. It's going to give you an excellent reference point because sometimes we're busy doing all these things and we get a little off track. And review that plan every year because your needs might not be the same next year. Uh, a brief uh, comment about bylaws and operating procedures. Uh, school councils are technically required to have bylaws. Uh, the Regulation 612 lays out three specifically you're required to have, and you may have others on top of that. Um, if you don't currently have bylaws, you are still bound by the Regulation 612, but I would encourage you to try to fit in bylaw writing somewhere close down the road. Um, there are some things that are priority right now, but bylaws really do help you focus your uh, energies. Uh, and on the difference between a bylaw and an operating procedure, because some councils have both, operating procedures basically describe how you're going to do what you're going to do. Uh, they're more flexible, they're easier to update than bylaws. So uh, we could have a whole session on this, but uh, we're not going to cover that today. Uh, there are resources on the TDSB website, there's posted webinars on how to write bylaws. Uh, there's going to be a workshop probably in the uh, PX November conference on how to write bylaws. So you can stay tuned for that. Uh, and if you really need some direct support, you can reach out to PIAC directly, uh, email at info at torontopiac.com and ask for some support on writing your bylaws. So a few words about meetings. Um, if you're lucky enough to have parents come out to your meeting, uh, you don't really want to discourage them with format. Uh, you, it's helpful if you explain, particularly at the beginning of the year when you're getting new parents in, explain what the meeting's going to look like. Are you guys a really formal meeting? Are you a more casual meeting? Are you strict about Robert's rules and you know, how you make decisions? Uh, that gives people an idea of what to expect. Uh, it's nice to make that personal contact with people coming in and having name tags in a normal uh, in-person meeting, but obviously in this case, we have names already in the uh, meeting format on the online Zoom. Your agenda is another way to uh, make your meeting structured. The chair will create the agenda in consultation with the principal. The chair creates the agenda. You want to send that out in advance, ideally a week before, so parents have time to look through that. And if you're having committee reports, teacher reports, even the principal's report, uh, send those out in advance too, so that you're not clogging up your meeting, reading reports. That really bores a lot of people. If they can read those in advance, then they come to the meeting prepared and you can get down to business. I like to put timing, uh, timed items on my agenda because I think it really helps everybody appreciate how long we're going to spend talking about each topic. And, and try to encourage discussion where you can. You can do breakout groups with Zoom and have small discussions and definitely follow up on agenda items. The best of intentions you've created this to do and you've wrote it down in the, min in the minutes that you're going to do X, Y, and Z, but nobody follows up on it. So X, Y, and Z maybe don't happen. Uh, that's the kind of thing that turns parents off of your school council. It does not make it attractive. Uh, you can assign a member to follow up items uh, within the minutes themselves. Uh, who's gonna take care of this item? and then follow up next month. Well, how did we do with that item? Do you need any help? That sort of thing. Virtual meetings. This is our new normal. Uh, the Parent Community Engagement Office has secured free Zoom accounts for every school council, which you will also be using to run your elections. A note on elections, if you have not yet had your school council election, uh, you're supposed to have this done within the first 30 days of school, which this year actually looks like the week of, of November the 1st. If you haven't had an election and you don't see any information coming up about an election, please reach out to your principal and find out how this can get done. And you are going to use the Zoom to do your elections. There is a guide on how to do that. 
If you look at the October issue of the PIAC Post, that's our monthly newsletter, which you can click on the link on our first page of our website. There is uh, links to all the information about how to have a Zoom election, virtual election. So with a virtual meeting, you're going to do a lot of the same things. You're going to send those things out in advance, your agenda, your reports. You're also going to send out the link and dial in instructions for parents to access your meeting. And it's not a bad idea to send out um, tips on how to uh, participate in the virtual meeting, et etiquette and such. And then during the meeting, maybe review that etiquette when you start out, let people know if you're going to be recording any portion of the meeting or the chat um, and assign a person to monitor your chat and your Q&A like, like Felicia is doing today. You can't easily run and chair a meeting at the same time that you're trying to address all the stuff that's coming up in the Q&A and the chat. Really need two people for that. So if you have co-chairs, great. If you don't have a, a co-chair or a vice chair, you can just ask a member to do that. Maybe it's your recording secretary because the chat is gonna be something that person uses to help write the minutes. You guys sort that out. And the great piece about Zoom is that it's got option to phone in. So if parents don't have a technology device, they can still call into the meeting. It's a little more challenging to participate as a phone-in participant. So please remember that if you've got phone-in participants to go over and check in with them from time to time to see if they have a question, to see if they want to raise their hand. Uh, on a cell phone, there are ways to do that. On a landline, I'm not sure that's as easy. But uh, check out our tips for how to do Zoom. Uh, that link will be in your handout kit as well. This is a, a concept uh, I saw at a presentation that I thought was really comforting uh, in looking at all the work that school councils do. Rome wasn't built in a day, neither was your school council. So you'll be on this spectrum somewhere. And this isn't just a straight line, it's actually a circle, it's a cycle. You may find yourself in one of these places and working towards being that highly functioning council. And then you get to stage three and those parents all graduate with their kids. So guess what? You're back at stage one. Nothing wrong with that. Just recognize where you are and, and prepare your workload accordingly. Don't overdo your, do it with uh, burning out your volunteers trying to do too much. If you can't, uh, if you don't have anyone to run the pizza lunch, well, guess what? Don't run a pizza lunch. People will live without pizza. Do your mandate. When you have time, when you've gotten through that, you can add things in as you move along. The accountability piece. To be a meaningful school council body to your community, the accountability piece is, is really quite strong and it demonstrates in the respect factor and it demonstrates that you are valuable. You're gonna consult with your community whenever you need to, or are supposed to, or both. And there are reporting components of school council, not glamorous, but really valuable and really important. Uh, some of these things are required and the reporting and the account and the annual report are required by regulation 612. Every council meeting and subcommittees must have minutes. Those minutes must be available to parents at the school for a minimum of four years. If you have uh, financial uh, records, those probably should be held for seven years in case there's an audit. The annual report, that's required for you to put out. This is not a corporate 25 page document. This can be as simple as one page. There's a template in the school council handbook for writing an annual report. Think about this piece as a great way to brag about what you did. Council works hard. Let's, let's let everybody know what we did this year. The principal shares that with the entire school community. These last two pieces, the PSAB and the SCOOVOOP, this is for councils who fundraise. Fundraising comes with a lot of paperwork. Public Sector Accounting Board is PSAB. There are several reports that you are required to complete and submit to the board when you do fundraising. And that last one, 
his school generated fundraise funds financial plan, I believe. That's the what I was talking about when I said you have to write a fundraising plan. That's the living document. There's a template for that. And you write that plan in consultation with your principal and the principal holds on to that. The accountability piece is transparency. And this is built in. The regulation 612 requires that all school council meetings, including subcommittees, are open to the public. You want to share your information and let people know what you're doing. Many parents have no idea what school councils do, so make sure you're sharing what you're doing. And evaluate your council. This great annual idea to assess what you've been doing that evaluate your plan and your goals. What worked, what didn't work? Welcome feedback. We're not perfect. Are there things we could have done better? Probably. Are there things that went really well? Great, let's celebrate those. Because you guys work hard, celebrate your successes. This kind of two-way communication piece is really going to enhance your value to your community as a council. So don't panic about this slide, it's on your handout. Uh, these are some ideas that you can use uh, to build that en engagement piece at your school council. Uh, you can do these uh, within your meetings, you can do separate uh, events now that you have your free Zoom. And uh, almost all of these things are virtually uh, transferable, except for probably the potluck, which is an excellent engagement activity, but I'm sure you can find a way to do a similar event in a virtual. Uh, ab avenue. These are ideas that help build that parent capacity to let them know what's going on at the school. They're also valuable school council planning tools because if your guidance counselor comes and, and lets you know uh, how uh, course selection works, well that's important to everybody in the secondary area. If you have uh, ad identified in your school improvement plan that your school has some mental health challenges, then maybe you want your social worker or your school psychologist to come and talk about that top issue. Maybe you want to bring in a professional uh, in that area if you can find one that takes $500. Uh, also, use the public health nurse. Every school has a public health nurse liaison person. Just ask your principal to connect you with that person. They have a lot of wonderful free sessions for a variety of age groups applicable for elementary, middle school, and high school. Great resources. Uh, encourage you to think about using ideas like this and building on those ideas to create that school council that is a resource to parents and not a task for them. Well, we've sure barreled through that. Thank you very much for coming. I'm hoping that you realize now that supporting families and building the partner relationship with your school is fulfilling your school council mandate. Striving for that authentic parent engagement piece over just the involvement things will make your council more meaningful to your community and attract more people to your community. Thank Toronto you, Nicole. People, I just wanted to plug the website, www.torontopiac.com is chock full of awesome resources, including the very wonderful school council toolkit which is under the school council's tab and this is a quick one pager two pager about a variety of topics with links to the references a really valuable resource especially if you're new to school council thank you nicole um just a reminder for parents who joined us late uh, the slides and this recording will be available on the parentsispartners.ca website, as well as a uh, handout that Nicole usually shares when she does these presentations in person. Uh, so look for resources on um, the parentsispartners.ca website. Um, so Nicole, there are a number of questions actually. Um, Great. In the chat. So some of the, uh, I've, tried, I've tried my best to group them together. Um, so one question is, uh, what communication tools can council adopt beyond the paper or email communications? What are suggestions you have? Well, you have your Zoom account, which is a great tool for communicating. 
Um, newsletter is a great way to promote what you're doing each month. Uh, don't discount the good old phone tree. Uh, a little more challenging today, uh, given the separation between families and, and virtual school and families and in-person school. So you'll have a few challenges there. Uh, very shortly, your school council will have access to School Messenger. School Messenger is the broadcast communication tool that your principal uses to send out um, information to the school community. Uh, I think that also involves the uh, robocall piece, so you can use that too. Uh, you can access your Zoom account and your School Messenger access through your TDSB School Council email account. So a word about that email account. Uh, every school has a TDSB email address that your principal can set up for you. You can, if you have an existing account, you can still link those so that you can use both. But what you get with the TDSB email account is a secure transferable address that is bound by the rules of uh, privacy for the uh, TDSB rules, privacy. Uh, you can, the address stays consistent no matter how many changes you have in personnel because all you do is change your login, the address stays the same. Whoever's on the end of that may change, but that address will always bring people to you. It also gives you access to those other things, the Zoom and your school messenger. So Nicole, there's actually a question about school, you know, looping that in about uh, alternative communications. And I know you mentioned school council messenger. Are officially our school councils allowed to have websites outside of the TDSB website? And also what about Facebook groups and what app, WhatsApp groups? What, what about your which? WhatsApp and Facebook oh, groups? Right. So there's a lot of great communication tools. There's nothing that says you cannot use WhatsApp or Google Meets or any of those things. Uh, some communities find those super valuable as ways to, to chat within a subcommittee, for example. So if that's what works for your school, I think you can use those things. Um, what was that first piece? I had something else I wanted to Web, say about that. Websites. Like oh, websites, yes. Uh, many school councils have an independent school council website uh, that requires that you have enough parents with the technical knowledge to operate the website, maintain the website, and continue it over the years. So some schools find that more work than they have people to do. You do have access to the school's website. The TDSB school website has a section for school councils and your principal may give you access or may have somebody in the administrative office that will post your minutes, your annual report, other information and event sharing. You always have access to that if you want for web communications. Okay, thanks. And there's a little follow-up question about whether or not school council funds can be used for website fees and digital branding and communications. Mm, this is an area that is challenging. You cannot fundraise for that, but you can potentially use that administrative funds. If your school council votes and decides that they want that $1.25 per pupil allotment money to go towards that piece of administration, uh, you probably can do that. It might not be enough money, Depends on how big your school is, how much money there is there. And your parent engagement funding, uh, I think that, that $500 could definitely be construed as something you could do reach outreach with. And I think that qualifies. These are all conversations you need to have with your principal. All right, thanks, Nicole. Uh, so there's a question about elections. And, um, there's a question, uh, I guess I'm gonna try to lump them all together. Um, so school councils are doing elections. Uh, they've shared position names, but they haven't shared the description of roles of how, or roles of how, um, or how parents are even elected. Where can people go to find this information? Mm, and that's I guess, a big challenge. Yes. yes, this is a common conundrum that, that councils have around elections because most of us actually run our elections contrary to 
what the regulation intends councils to be. As per regulation 612, you are to define the total number of parents that will be on your school council. For example, 10. You elect 10 parents to school council. Those 10 parents then are to divide up the roles of whatever executive positions that you have. Many schools find this um, contrary to how they operate uh, and are afraid that if they do that, nobody will step up for the particular roles if they didn't have them in advance. So many councils operate their elections. Here's the positions we need to fill. Who wants to run? I think it is really crucial to provide information on what the responsibilities of those positions are. This is where your bylaws and your operating procedures become really useful because your operating procedures can include a job description of each of those roles. So it's a great way to get together and define, okay, who's gonna do what? How are we gonna divide up these tasks? The chair has certain responsibilities, but they don't have to do everything. They just have to make sure everything gets done. So aside from the agenda, you know, someone else could write the annual report. It doesn't have to be the chair, but decide these things and communicate. And if your council's not doing that, that's a terrific place to start this year. So just to follow up on that, Margaret, uh, sorry, Nicole, just talking about Margaret in the chat. Um, <laughs> I want to uh, bring up that uh, there's questions about, you know, can our parents, are all parents automatically members of the school council? And if an item comes up, can everybody vote? And do all parents vote in electing school council positions? Okay, this is an area that took me come some time to sort out myself. All parents of the school are allowed to vote for the school council membership. So if you've defined school council as 10 people, everyone in the school gets to vote for those 10 people, one vote per parent. Once that school council is elected, those people are the ones who do the voting on behalf of the school community. So technically those people, however many there are in your council, that is why you consult your community. You're voting on their behalf. You need to know what their opinion is. So a good example of how this might work is the school council meeting has 50 people in attendance. Wow, it did happen once. And 10 of them are elected as the school council. Everybody at the meeting discusses the topics. The school council then is the one that votes. Those 10 people vote on behalf of that conversation that they had. Does that make sense? I hope it does. I hope it does. Um, also, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on elections because there's other ways that other questions in the chat, but uh, yes, there's certainly uh, information that can be shared about elections um, and also the makeup of a school council. Um, Go to on... the school council's toolkit on the PIAC site. There's going to be a lot of answers to your questions in there. Yes, thank you. Uh, school torontopiac.com slash resources dot html and then look for the button that says school council toolkit. Um, other questions. Those links are, are on your handout. <laughs> and uh, the other questions that are coming up are um, when does the SIP have to be submitted? You mentioned uh, November 13th. Uh, is there a deadline? And is this shared with the parent community at large, the SIP? Mm. There used to be a hard deadline on the school improvement plan that was in November. Uh, that sort of shifted a few years back. It is a bit more of a living document than it used to be. Um, Generally, it is something you want to work on at the beginning of the year. That makes sense. You've got your data. You've got your feedback. You're going to put together your school improvement plan. Your principal is going to be doing this in the fall, most likely. So that's when you want to be involved. The November 13th deadline, I think, might be for the school statement of needs. Um, bit challenging if you haven't had your election yet. You're going to be scrambling to put that together. But like I say, uh, the general consensus seems to be that we've got bigger fish to fry this year and the deadlines seem to be a bit less strict, but I would definitely want to confirm 
uh, with your principal what the schedule of activities will be. Uh, thank you. That's right. Uh, the school statement of needs is what I had in mind as well when I was thinking. Same about time of November year. 13. Yes, but same time of year. Um, and I would say I would agree with you that, uh, you know, these are living documents and that they're all these deadlines are guidelines. I wouldn't say they're deadlines. In this particular this year, year particular, for this yeah. year. Yes, I would agree with you. Um, I guess there's a question about um, about the assigned funds for the GL 41500 that you had in your mm -hmm. slides. Uh, is that deposited in the school account or the school council account? And uh, when is it deposited? And uh, do you have to present a plan of how you're going to use it in order to receive those funds? You do not have to present a plan. You do have to make a decision at the council level on what you're gonna do with that money. Uh, that money sits in the school's account, the school budget. That general ledger line is the school's budget line. That's the money that is delivered to the school for school councils to use. Um, if you have a separate school council account, that money doesn't move into your account. That money stays in the school's account uh, because that's who they use it on your behalf which is why you have to talk about how you want to use that money as a council. And I don't think a lot of councils, A, know about that money and B, discuss how to use that money. Uh, no formal written plan that I've ever seen. All right, thank you. What about- That's what your minutes are for. You write it in your minutes, you've got a record of the plan. Okay, another question here is, uh, what a, do you have any suggestions on how to use money in the school council accounts like from last year because a lot of councils obviously many councils have funds remaining from last year because we only spent half a year um, do you have any suggestions for to use it in a way that'll benefit in school and virtual school parents first of all it's quite challenging because as per the rules we're not supposed to carry money over in our school council account so that's a bit of a challenge. Uh, we of course have to in this case because of the pandemic. Um, I would certainly have conversation within your school council about this um, since they are basically letting us carry it over. The challenge for the dual duality of in-person school versus virtual school is really tough but because virtual parents are still intended to be part of their home school for communications and for school council, they can run and be elected to any position on the school council. Um, they should be rejoined to the school communications. When the virtual schools were set up, there was a bit of a technical glitch where the parents who went to the virtual school got removed from the communications database. So principals received instructions on how to bring them back into the school's communication. So if you have virtual parents that aren't there, uh, they should be there. And there are guidance um, for how to do that. I'm not sure if that was in the PX website, but there definitely was guidance shared. You can uh, email info at torontopiac.com to ask for that particular link and we can get that sent out to you for if your principal is struggling and your office administrator is struggling to get those parents added back into your list. So I would say that if you're going to host virtual events anyway, as a school council, you can definitely address the needs of both portions of your school. Um, this is where the consultation piece comes in. Um, what do in-person parents need? What do virtual parents need? Find out if those things are the same, mental health, for example, you can run a workshop that covers both. If they're drastically different, you could run separate sessions, be my suggestion. Okay. Um, I guess another question is about um, engagement. Uh, one scenario here is whenever I've attended school council meetings, basically council members, subcommittee reps, and principals share read reports. Um, you've suggested doing that in advance so that council can actually get down to business 
what does getting down to business actually look like? Can you give an example of content for a meaningful meeting? I would say the content for your meaningful meeting um, could stem from some of the things on the school council checklist. That's part of the toolkit. Uh, that is a month by month breakdown of things that council could be doing or should be doing if there's deadline related. So the getting down to business would be the discussion to prepare your school improvement plan, for example. Uh, look, get that template out, share that template, have a discussion. What is unique about our school community? Uh, the school improvement plan, a great topic of conversation. Uh, this could require more than one meeting because there's three goals within the school improvement plan. There could be a lot of discussion. You could have dedicated topic uh, for each area, the equity, the achievement, and the well-being piece. And, this, and those needs that when you develop your, your goals for the year, you're looking at all the input that I was talking about and pick those topics. If there's something in there that is a good discussion topic, I think that getting down to business either looks like having those valuable conversations and or uh, completing those deadline items. Okay, thank you. Um... All right, uh, there's a question about the school council dollars and whether that go into the school budget, right? The 41,500 that you GL number. Is that gonna reflect uh, all the students in virtual school in addition to the ones attending in person? That's an awesome question and I don't have the answer for that. I think okay. it's intended to, but. Okay. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, plus that money is a use it or lose it. It replenishes every year, but it does not, it does not accumulate. Okay. Um, I guess my, there's other questions coming in. Um, there's a comment about uh, bylaws and how many school council bylaws have mention of physical meeting and voting in person um, and that you know some advice would be to look at revising the bylaws as you mentioned or if you don't have bylaws yet to consider including bylaws that accommodate virtual uh, meetings. Absolutely this is our new normal and many councils have had this conversation in the past about virtual participation and now the issue is is, is we need to have that conversation and include it. It's not really optional anymore. Okay, uh, so just wanted to say, just confirm that, um, you know, virtual school students haven't, it hasn't completely been made clear about whether or not they're going to be counted towards the homeschool, I, I think is what we, we discussed earlier. Yeah, the, the um, money part? Yeah, I'm yes, not 100% sure part. about that. Okay. Um, so the question is, um, there's a question about if, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to scroll up because I had them all sorted out and now it's, uh, oh, is, is there a minimum or maximum amount of funds that you can carry over in your budget or your school council fund? Fundraised funds, there isn't yeah. an amount uh, laid out, but you are intended to spend the money you raise within the year you raise it. The exception to that would be if you're fundraising for a big ticket item like a playground, that's going to take a couple of years to accrue enough money to, to do that. Um, that said, we are currently are carrying money over from last year. Uh, there hasn't really been any uh, guidance around that. I would just do your best to uh, find useful ways to use your funds uh, this year in this situation that support student achievement. And uh, if you have to carry some over, well, just make sure you're well documented and everybody is very transparent. Okay, thanks, Nicole. There's actually, I think this, we're, we're out of time, but this one last question I think is really important in this time. Sure. Uh, is there any, um, are there any restrictions for councils to proceed with any business, council business? like? For example, this school, um, this question is, we had elections, but the chair said we can't set goals. 
until we have more info on school council's role, given the current situation with COVID. Well, I kind of disagree with that. There is no restrictions uh, on school council activities at this time. Uh, you certainly can go ahead and start your planning. I mean, you may not have all the information that you want, but I think you have a lot of the information to start the planning process uh, and start having those conversations. You're welcome. Uh, so um, I think there's a lot of questions that we that are still coming through on the chat. A lot of them are uh, certainly about um, bylaws and how to operate school councils and some barriers that people are seem to be facing. I would uh, highly so recommend that the, the operations piece, you go to your school council's toolkit on the PIAC website. A lot of your answers will be there. Yes, and, and you can also reach out to your PIAC rep. And if you're not sure, you can go on the PIAC website. There's a list of the reps. And you can also just contact the info at torontopiac.com and ask to be connected. Thank you. That was that was the plug I was going to also give. And uh, also, you know, I, I suggest in this time of community, you know, consider reaching out to schools in your in your neighborhood and other school councils and, you know, support each other. Yeah. All right. Thank We're you. All everyone. Part of the same game. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And uh, we really we really hope that. Uh, you found this session informative and uh, useful. And thank you, Nicole, for sharing your tidbits, nuggets of uh, information. And um, I know we weren't able to get to all the questions, but uh, if, you're, if you'd like to connect, uh, by all means, connect with info at torontopiac.com and um, ask to uh, get uh, connected with Nicole. They can send off information her way uh, and or connect with your PIAC rep would be able to help you as well. Okay, thank Absolutely. you. Thanks very much for uh, helping our, our uh, group today, Felicia. Um, I hope that all of you got some valuable information. I hope that you're going to go back to your school council and really focus on your mandate and being a resource for families in your community. And I hope that you're gonna reduce how much fundraising you do because it's not your job to pay for school. You're not their bank. Thanks a lot. Thank you and have a great day, everyone.